Hi there, during today's session I'm going to be talking about orbital motion. Now orbital motion is, if you think about it, is the motion around a, a larger mass and the centripetal force of the circular motion is provided by a gravitational attraction. Now the rules relating to this were summarized by Kepler's three laws. Now, as it happens he's got three important laws uh, but the IB or the IB physics course is only really going to concentrate on the third law uh, just because um, we're looking at a simplified scenario where we're not looking at ellipses we're looking at circular motion only. Okay? But I'll still give you a bit of background on Kepler's three laws. So Kepler's first law. Uh, the orbit of each planet around the Sun is an eclipse with the Sun at one focus point. Okay, So we have these eclipse-like orbits and as I said the IB is just thinking about circular motion, so we don't need to worry about this at all. Kepler's second law, he recognized that uh, if we look at the um, area within a planetary sweep over 30 days duration, and compare that to the area of another 30 day duration, we find that the areas are equal. So that's the second rule, which Kepler came up with. Now the third rule is the important one because this is what the IB cares about. Now Kepler's third law of planetary motion says that the square of the orbital period is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. Okay, so uh, if we think about this, the semi-major axis, and when we're talking about circular motion, just means it's the radius of the orbit. So if we have the average distance of uh, a planet to the sun cube, that's going to be proportional to the period of one rotation squared. So that's his important third law. And one of the things you're going to need to do is be able to derive that. So let me take, let me, let me take you through those steps. So deriving the third law. We start off with, we suppose we have a planet of mass m and it moves with speed v in a circular radius around the sun with capital M. So therefore, gravitational attraction of the sun is capital G, capital M, multiplied by small m, divided by r squared. So this is from Newton's law of universal gravitation. So that's fair enough. Now, this is the centripetal force keeping the planet in orbit. So that means we can recognize that this force is going to be equal to mv squared over r. This can be rearranged to show that uh, we can cancel the masses of the uh, planets. Uh, we can cancel one of the r, so we end up with gravitational constant times the mass of the sun divided by the radius of the orbit equals the velocity squared. What can we do with this? So now we're going to take a little bit further. If t is the time for a planet to make one orbit, okay, then that means that the velocity is going to be the um, circumference of the orbit, so that's 2 pi r divided by t. And in turn, uh, v squared is 2 squared pi squared r squared divided by capital T squared. Now, if we use this information, we place it into the formula we had before, we find out that uh, gravitational constant times the mass is equal by 4 pi squared r squared times r times t squared. And you notice I've just multiplied r on both sides. If we work with this a little further, we get uh, gravitational constant times the mass of the central uh, sun equals 4 pi squared r cubed divided by the period squared. Now if we simplify it further we recognize that r cubed divided by t squared equals gm over 4 pi squared and we're going to notice that that is a constant so therefore proving Kepler's third law. So that's Kepler's third law, which is useful. We're going to think about the energy of orbiting satellites now. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about the potential energy. Now, if we look at potential energy, we're going to recognize a satellite of mass m 
orbiting. In this case, we'll consider Earth to be the central uh, object and it's going to be distance R from Earth. The reason for this is because the scenario is often with uh, satellites around planet Earth. That's a common scenario. It could equally be a planet which is acting as a satellite around the Sun. So the gravitational potential we know is going to be minus uh, g times the mass of the Earth divided by the radius of this orbit. Now, that means that the gravitational potential energy is going to be the uh, gravitational potential multiplied by the mass of the object. The gravitational potential is going to be minus g mass of the Earth times mass of the object divided by the radius of the orbit. Now, if we plot these as graphs, and now these are important, as you're going to need to recognize these as required by the IB. So if we look at the impact of the radius against the potential, and we see that the potential is proportional to minus 1 over r, and if we plot the potential against 1 over r, we get that the potential is equal to minus k divided by r. Now, k is the constant of proportionality, and we happen to be able to work that out and recognize it's going to be equal to gravitational constant times by the mass of the Earth times by the mass of the object we're looking at. So that's gravitational. Now we're going to think about energy of the orbiting satellite, and we think about kinetic energy. So with kinetic energy, what we have, we're going to use the law of gravitation, uh, universal gravitation, and Newton's second law, and that tells us that if we have uh, the centripetal force is going to be equal to the universal uh, the gravitational attractive force. Now, from this we can work out kinetic energy. Because we know that kinetic energy equals half mv squared. So therefore, uh, this is going to be equal to, so you'll see all I'm doing here is I've got mv squared already. Uh, I'm multiplying or dividing by 2 and this is going to equal to the gravitational constant multiplied by the mass of the Earth multiplied by the mass of the object divided by 2r. So now I've got the kinetic energy of an orbiting satellite. Again, this is important. You need to recognize the graphs related to this. So for kinetic energy, what I've got here is two graphs, and we can see the kinetic energy uh, is proportional to 1 over r, so it's dropped as the radius increases, and if we plot kinetic energy against 1 over r, it, we can see that there's a k is the constant proportionality, and this is equal to gm mass of the earth, that's by the mass of the object, divided by 2. So those are the graphs you're going to have to recognize. Now obviously, we're now going to think about the total energy. So that's the potential energy plus the kinetic energy. Now we've got numbers here, so we know how to calculate this. And if we do the sum, we're going to work out the total energy is equal to minus gravitational constant times the mass of the Earth times the mass of the object divided by 2 times the orbiting radius. So that's the total energy, and this energy is constant for a circular orbit, okay? Because the radius stays constant, so it's a constant value. Plotting that becomes fairly simple then. So what we can do here is that we see that the total energy um, is uh, again uh, related to the radius. Now we can see if we're doing some simple calculations that the total energy is proportional to minus 1 over r and the total energy is proportional to 1 over r, and that constant of proportionality is g times the mass of the Earth times the mass of the planet divided by 2. There's lots of similarities there, you just have to be able to recognize these formulas, that's really, really, really important, and then apply them to these graphs. So that gives you an overview of the energy. The final thing I want to talk about is weightlessness. Now, we've got a, a classic lift situation. Now, if you're standing in a lift, and on a set of scales, now what happens is that your weight 
will be equal to mass times gravity. And this is always the case. However, if we looked at a set of scales, uh, their response when you're not moving, the scales would show your weight would equal to mass times gravity. Now, if you are accelerating uh, due to g upwards, suddenly that changes the situation dramatically. And what will happen is that uh, if we apply F equals ma, that means the weight minus mg is going to equal uh, mg. Now that seems kind of odd, but what it's telling us here is that if we're accelerating upwards, your weight is going to be apparently um, two times the uh, two times mass times gravity. That's interesting enough. So I guess we can always imagine when we are uh, going upwards in a lift, you can feel like it's been pushing down on you a little bit more. We can probably apply to that. Now, I'm hoping no one's been in a situation when a lift has been in free fall. But this is what we need to think about. In this situation, what we'll see is because we'll be accelerating downwards at the same speed as the lift, suddenly we find a situation where uh, we've got W minus mg is going to equal to minus mg. So that means that the weight shown is going to be equal to zero. And now we have a weightless situation. So that means if you're in an object which is accelerating downwards due to, uh, due to gravity, then you will feel weightless. And it's something that you may feel slightly as you go down, up and down a lift. You may be slightly aware of this context. Now this can be applied to circular motion or orbital motion because what we find is that if we were in a spaceship, we'd uh, feel orbital weightlessness. Because what's happening here, an uh, orbiting spacecraft has a centripetal equation uh, acceleration equal to g1, uh, where the uh, g1 is the acceleration due to gravity at the height of the orbit. Now that means that if you are in this spaceship, uh, the spaceship will also have the same centripetal acceleration. That's why you'll undergo the feeling of weightlessness. So uh, there's no acceleration relative to the spacecraft. Okay, so it's about the fact the spacecraft is falling with exactly the same acceleration. So therefore, you will feel weightless. As you can see in the diagram, this is the situation of weightlessness. Now, the same situation could happen if you're in a place of very, very deep space and all gravity would be equal to gravitational attraction would balance out and it equal to zero. But here's one which we can recreate, and that's something which people are spending a lot of money going up into airplanes to go to high altitudes to have this weightless feeling. So that's all the ideas about orbital motion uh, captured. I hope that's useful for you.